Hello, and welcome to another Progressives for Immigration Reform podcast. I am your host, Kevin Lynn, and I'm also the Executive Director of Progressives for Immigration Reform. And today is September 21, 2021. And we have a real treat for everyone today. I'm going to be joined by an environmental author, Frosty Woolrich, and we're going to be talking about his latest book, America's Overpopulation Predicament, Blindsiding Future Generations. I'm going to inter- uh, bring it. So, Frosty, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be with you. And hopefully this broadcast is going to enlighten and certainly going to educate and it's going to sober each and every listener, especially if you're a parent, as to what the future holds for your children. And so I'm very excited. And the main point of this podcast, and certainly this book, is to create a national and even international discussion debate on what kind of a civilization we're bequeathing to our children. Great, thank you. Before we dive into things, Frosty, I'm going to read your bio. I know you're a, you're a humble guy, but this is an amazing bio, and I want to share it with our audience. Now, you graduated from Michigan State University, got a degree in journalism and advertising, and earned a postgraduate degree in English literature from Grand Valley State University in Michigan as well. You're an avid mountain climber, scuba diver, swing dancer, skier, and long haul bicyclist. And we'll be talking about that today because you've been all over the world with your bicycle. You've rafted, canoed, backpacked, sailed, windsurfed, snowboarded, and more all over this planet. You've bicycled over 100,000 miles on six continents, and you crossed on bicycle 15 times the United States. Your featured articles have appeared in national and international magazines for more than 40 years. You write and speak on overpopulation and environmental challenges facing humanity. You taught at the elementary, high school, and college levels. And you've been interviewed by the likes of NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, and well over 1,500 radio shows in the past 20 years. Frosty Woolridge, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, one of the things that I'm always appreciative of, having ridden my bicycle across all these six continents and uh, so 15 times across the United (laughs) States, is is that I didn't get run over. (laughs) Ouch. So, yeah. So kudos to you. Well, Frosty, your book, I'm going to show everyone uh, the, the, the front page of your book. And again, America's overpopulation predicament, blindsiding future generations. And to set the tone of our podcast, Frosty, I'm going to read a quote from your book. And it reads, we've created a monster civilization of 330 million people. You're talking about here in the United States, the United States civilization that cannot be sustained. The roots appear to be traced to our insatiable appetite for growth and an attitude of damn the cost. Consumerism, how do you tell people to turn off desire for bigger, faster, newer, and fancier? Maybe the planet has the answer. Screw with mother nature long enough and she'll screw you back twice as hard. (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, Frosty, uh, that uh, that pretty much, uh, I think, sets the uh, the tone of our conversation. Well, it certainly does. And, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. And to each one of you listening to this broadcast, I hope you share it with all of your friends, share it with your community, share it with your city council, share it with your senators and, and certainly your governor because all of us are riding uh, essentially the USS Titanic right now. And with the realities that we face, we need to start turning the Titanic to avoid the overpopulation iceberg, if you will. And one of the things I want to also bring to your attention that on an individual level, we are uh, 
I'll use the movie Thelma and Louise. Remember they were driving a T-Bird, 66 T-Bird, and they had done so many bad things that the cops were chasing them and they drove that T-Bird right over a cliff because they didn't want to face the consequences and of course they perished. Individually, that's what's going to happen to all of our children in 2050 when all of the consequences are going to convene. And one of the things that I bring about in my book, and I think it's very important, is that in the introduction, uh, it's by Isaac Marion, The Burning World. The apocalypse didn't happen overnight. The world didn't end in a satisfying climax of explosive special effects. It was slow. It was boring. It was one little thing at a time. One building here, another factory over there, one plastic container tossed into the ocean, then another and another until their numbers reached 5.25 trillion floating or sunk beneath the waves, pieces of plastic. One moral compromise, one abandoned ideal, and one more justified injustice. No dramatic wave of destruction sweeping across the world, just scattered spots of rot forming throughout the decades, seemingly isolated incidents until the moment they all merged, unquote. If you can get a handle on that, that quote by Isaac Marion, that's what's been happening to the United States really since 1945 when World War II finished. That's when they started taking all of the uh, lucite and, and then all of the uh, gases uh, for gassing people on the fields. Uh, they were all, all those, all those chemicals were now, what, were, what are we going to do with them? Well, they dumped them into the oceans. Uh, they dumped them into the Gulf. They dumped them into the Pacific and the Atlantic. Uh, and all the other uh, countries that were using all these chemicals did the same thing. Right. I mean, if you look at like our Gulf Coast, because of the fertilizer, there are essentially miles of dead zone at That's the correct. mouth of the, Louisi of the Louisiana River. And 10,000 square miles, actually. Amazing. Just amazing 10, to me. Yeah. You know, and as a scuba diver, I've seen the destruction of the I've scuba dived all over the planet. Uh, the, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, the Galapagos Islands. Uh, Hawaii, uh, the Atlantic, the Pacific, uh, the Great Lakes, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, off of Australia in the Indian Ocean. And over the last 63 years of, of, of you know, scuba diving, I, I watched the pristine oceans turn into plastic oceans. Uh, there, there's 46,000 pieces of plastic floating on every square mile of, of the Earth's ocean right now, according to uh, Julia Woody in, in One Earth magazine, and she's a great research biologist. Well, I got to see it firsthand. I've seen the drift nets. I've seen the turtles get snared. I've seen turtles that can't get down into the water to feed because they've got so much styrofoam in their stomach, they float. I've seen uh, sharks hung up and dolphins hung up. Uh, you, you just go on and on and on, uh, the oceans. And for those of you who want to see a movie version or a documentary version of this book that I've written to complement what I've said in the book, I highly recommend the 90 minute documentary called Seaspiracy, S-E-A-S-P-I-R-A-C-Y, 90 minute documentary. And if you wanna see what's happening to the land, which I talk about in the book also, go see Cowspiracy, again, C-O-W-S-P-I-R-A-C-Y, and you will then see a moving 90 minute video of the air, the land and the water and how fast we're destroying it. And, and so if anything can come of this broadcast, do everything you can to move it across this country. I'm actually giving a free electronic copy to anyone and everyone who wants to contact me through my email, frostyw at juno.com because it has nothing to do about money. What we're trying to do here is save our civilization. And this book has that potential. If it gets read by enough people, we can actually create a tipping point. In other words, when you read the book or you see the two documentaries, you can't unsee them and you can't unread this book. Mm -hmm. The facts will absorb into your brain. And once these facts absorb into your brain, and you realize your children will be alive in 2050, then you want to start doing something. You right. want to take action. 
And, and, and does that make sense, Kevin? Yeah. And, and here in the United States, because your book is about overpopulation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, we, we were talking the pre-interview, you had mentioned that, you know, you came in at the beginning of the baby boom generation and I was born in 1962, so I kind of came in at the end of it. So the things have changed in the generations, but here in America, uh, we have the opportunity to do something about the numbers, the, the, the population, because unlike, and we're going to, I know you're going to talk about India, China, Bangladesh, uh, the continent of Africa and the population issues there, but we can actually control our population simply by regulating and restricting immigration. And we used to do a great job of it, Frosty, for instance, yes. I'm the son of an immigrant. When my mother came here in 1952, they had let out about 178,000 green cards that year. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, we let out over 1.2 million. And just sitting, since Joe Biden took office, we more than 2 million people have come into the United States outside of any, any semblance of a legal immigration system. Frosty, how did we get here? What are the consequences of that? Uh, help our help me and my audience get our heads around that. Well, it's it's going to be quite a ordeal to get your head around it, to get your arms around this, because what's coming to us, and I'm, I'm putting my hands up in front of the camera to show you, is it's very difficult to get your emotional arms around this, your intellectual arms around this. And, and certainly, if you look at what's coming and if you understand that you are on the USS Titanic, uh, it gets pretty sobering. Actually, I've had some people say, well, this is fear mongering. Uh, and in fact, facts are not, you can't use any words against facts. Uh, facts are facts. And so you can either deal with facts and you can move positively with solutions and or you can sit there and give up and say, well, it's just going to happen and I'm on the Titanic. I'm, I'm one of those optimists that says you can you can make a difference in, in your individual family, in your individual community, in your own city and right up to your own state level. And then finally, uh, into the national level, uh, all of us that's each and every one of us has the right and the ability to get to contact 60 Minutes and say, hey, I want to hear about this. I want this Frosty Wooldridge guy interviewed, or I want uh, Richard Heinberg, or I want Chris Clugston, or I want some of the, the brilliant men and women. Jane Goodall, uh, she talks about overpopulation herself. We need to have these kind of spokesmen and spokeswomen up there in 60 Minutes virtually every every week because this is the number one issue facing all Americans right now. And that is the fact that we're on course to add 100 million people to this country and 90% of it is from legal and illegal immigration and their birth rates. Those are the facts. We can change those realities by changing course, again, like the... Uh, Titanic. And, 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 and again, do you want your children to be like Thelma and Louise, the movie Thelma and Louise, as I've, I've mentioned? And the answer is no, you don't want to have your kids going over a demographic cliff when they would like to live a life just like you've lived. I would love for every human being on the planet to live a life that I've lived. Food, water, energy, ability to travel, quality of life, standard of living, those are all assured if we have a stable and sustainable civilization. And that's what this book's all about. So let me cover, uh, is, am I giving a decent promo on this, Kevin? Yeah, absolutely. But I'd sure like you to get into the details as you've explained in the book, you know, how we mm -hmm. kind of got here. Because, you know, we seem to understand, if you were an environmentalist in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s, you seem to understand and appreciate the value of restraint and somehow mm -hmm. that's been replaced with consumerism you that's know right. like i just i have a 2004 subaru and a couple years ago i had rebuilt the engine and the guy goes oh you'll get another eighty thousand miles out of this 
And yet most people today, to, you know, what they'd rather do is just go ahead and buy a Prius or buy a Tesla if they can afford it. And that just seems to be the wrong track, the wrong mindset. Well, it certainly is the wrong mindset. Uh, and, and at the same time, most people never make the connection, say, just as an example, Bill McKibben, whom I've uh, uh, met in, in Boulder, uh, along with some of my other colleagues like uh, Governor Dick Lamb and, and certainly uh, Dr. Albert Bartlett, uh, who are, you know, who are and were brilliant uh, uh, men of letters and certainly authors of books and programs showing what was coming and what is coming to our country. And the, the thing that really is frustrating to me is everybody's you know worried about global warming and it's changing the climate. And in my book, uh, from my experiences down in Antarctica, when I lived and worked on the ice and wrote for the Antarctic Sun, we have, we have and we are changing the climate. It is called catastrophic climate destabilization. And you're seeing that in hurricanes like Katrina and Sandy and uh, Ida, and it goes on down the line. Typhoons out there wiping out half the Philippines. Uh, the oceans are getting billions and billions and billions of tons of carbon tossed into the, the, the oceans because uh, we burn 100 million barrels of oil every year. Uh, 100, literally 100 billion barrels of oil get burned every year. And nobody seems to understand that there's a limit to that kind of damage to the planet and the planet's starting to kick back on us. And so, again, why we did what we did uh, in 1965 with no debate and allowing Teddy Kennedy, the U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, Howard Metzenbaum and Jacob Javits to change the immigration from 200 or less, 200,000 or less per year to 1.2 million per year and then add another 100 million people to the United States and, and literally within 40 years. And now uh, to add another 100 million within the next 29 years is one, one of history's all time greatest traumas and dramas and, and consequences that our children are going to pay a severe price for. Because we in 1970, the average female in America chose birth control and has averaged and have been averaging 2.03 children since 1970. So it's not our society and our citizens who did this to us. It is the U.S. Congress and, and no one's changing this thing. It seems like immigration is the last taboo and the last taboo really will be the final taboo for our civilizations if we can, if we continue on this path. And so what I want to do is to give you a little thumbnail of this book. And I'm not sure I said this, but I want to repeat it. If you want a documentation of my book in, in a video, I, I highly recommend Sea Spiracy. I've been a scuba diver for 63 years. I've seen the oceans get trashed by plastics and chemicals and you name it. So go watch the movie, the, the video, and it's on Netflix. Seaspiracy, S-E-A-S-P-I-R-A-C-Y. And I'll, I'll and put, we'll see, put a link. We'll put a link to that in the comments section. Okay. And then if you want to see what's going on on the land and the air and the water with the 84,000 different chemicals that we're injecting uh, into uh, the air and the land and the water 24-7, watch Cowspiracy. And you can, like I say, you can get them on YouTube. You can get them literally anywhere. And so when you read those, or when you watch those two movies, you will see in action what my book documents in print. And, and once you see those two movies and you read my book, you can't unread them. You, you cannot unsee them. You're going to be enlightened and you're going to be educated. And you're going to know more than you're going to know more than the president of the United States right now and all 545 congressional critters up there because they don't understand what you are about to understand with this book and certainly with those two videos. And they will show you the dire consequences that we're facing and your children are facing and anybody that's living in this country in 2050. Again, only a scant 30, 29 years from now. Because I am a lead baby boomer of, I can't believe it, but I'm almost 75, you can't believe how fast 
29 years is going to go by. It's going to slip, you know, slip past in a blink of time. So let's give you more enlightenment from the printed page here. The contents of my book, The Perfect Storm Gathering Over America. Can we or will we save ourselves from exponential growth? That means growth that never stops. It's like a cancer cell. And that's what we're doing here in the United States right now. We're having exponential growth forced on us by Congress and the Immigration Reform Act of 1965 and then updated in 1986. Because you had then, mentioned Albert Bartlett earlier, another mm -hmm. Coloradan, and it was he did that amazing video on exponential growth. And mm -hmm. it was funny. Uh, someone said, you've got to look at this. And I said, why? He goes, well, it's really kind of boring in a way. I mean, if it's it's not a well-produced video. It's some mm. old guy talking to a small class, but it will blow your mind. And it absolutely did. That's correct. And Al Bart was a friend of mine, along with Dick Lamb. Uh, both of them passed away. In fact, Dick Lamb just passed away on August 1st. Uh, I went to his memorial, uh, one of the great men of history. His wife, uh, Dottie Lamb, also a great woman of history. Uh, and so we have some great men and women of history telling us that we need to change course. Jane Goodall has said it over and over again. Even the Dalai Lama has said that there are too many people on the planet and we can't keep doing this. So mm -hmm. we're getting markers uh, from really astounding um, uh, human beings around the planet, and yet we're not paying attention to them. Uh, can we save the rest of the world from human overpopulation? And of course, the answer is no, we can't. Because the, the rest of the world adds 83 million net gain new babies every year. So in the next 29 years, the third world is going to add 2.2 billion more people to reach somewhere over 10 billion people on the planet. And of course, it's not sustainable. And then what will the future look like if we continue on course to add another 100, 200 or 300 million more people to the United States? Because if we continue on this immigration course, before the end of the century, we will be tapping on 625 million more people. I mean, that we will have a total of 625 million people here in the United States, a jump from 330 million here in 2021. Okay, one, say that one more time. By what year will we have 625 million people here in the United States? That's correct. Uh, at the current rate of birth uh, of immigrants and, and their children, and our own population momentum, if we continue on this path, we will jump from 330 million to 440 million by 2050 and 625 million by 2095. Uh, Frosty, <laughs> we don't know where we're gonna put people now. You look at the degree of homelessness, desperation mm -hmm. out there, the mm -hmm. number of Americans living in poverty, I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking just America, where we're a quote unquote wealthy, developed mm -hmm. Western nation. And right. you're talking literally that we're going to double the number of people. We're going to double the consumption. Um, That's right. Where's the where's the infrastructure going to come from? I, I, I don't understand. You know, California's problem is they have almost 40 million people and the infrastructure that's built has been built for 16 million. And That's correct. As a matter of fact, I, I have uh, bicycled the length and width of uh, California seven times in the last 40 years. I even lived in San Diego uh, back in 65 when there were only 15 million people. Uh, well, today you can't even get into Yosemite. You have to have uh, a reservation. Uh, even then, you're lucky. To, it's going to be just random luck to get into Yosemite. Uh, 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 there are 39 million people in, San, uh, in, in all of California. Uh, in fact, just two years ago, I bicycled the whole West Coast. Uh, 12 million trees had died because they didn't get enough water. Uh, Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes talked about toilet to tap water. And yet she, I wrote her personally. I said, well, why didn't you talk about the fact that California was going to jump from 39 million to 59 million? In other words, they're, they're going to jump 20 million more people and they don't have the water right now to irrigate the crops or, or irrigate the people and certainly irrigate and feed and water the, the, the animals. And the Central Valley is literally being eaten up by development and they're just growing and growing and growing, exponential growth. Again, like a cancer cell, in the end will completely destroy the host. 
And so California is in a lot of trouble. But that that fact is over in New York City. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Let me give you a, a perspective here. If we continue on this path, what does 100 million people look like? It means hmm. that the 35 largest cities in the United States will double in population. Double. And I want you to understand that. Uh, New York City, 8.3 million will hit 16.6 million. 4 million, 5 million in uh, Chicago will hit 10 million. The state of Florida right now with 19 million people is expected to double. Double. 19 million. It's going to go to 38 million, folks. Uh, hmm. How do you, and, and they're already in a water crisis down there. How do you how do you even begin to solve the consequences that are going to just land on Florida with that many people? Texas, who has water uh, problems right now in 2021, is going to add 10 million more people. Uh, Phoenix, that has no water, depends totally on the Colorado River, which is just drying up like the Sahara Desert, uh, is expected to uh, double in population. So as you can see, no one's paying attention to the facts of today, and yet they're running this exponential growth into the future with no understanding of the consequences. So let me give you some ideas. Thanks. First of all, in section one, the deadliest birth rate affecting all humanity. Africa, which is literally screaming out with immigrants running into the, into the uh, European countries like crazy, Africa houses 1.4 billion people. The United Nations projects that current birth rates, Africa is going to jump to 2 billion people by 2050 and 4 billion before the end of the century. In other words, they can't feed themselves now. I mean, a place like Somalia is, people are screaming out of Somalia because they can't even eat because they don't have any, they don't have any. So to give you an example about Africa's dilemma, Literally, millions of people are starving over there right now, and yet they're going to double to 2 billion people here uh, within a short amount of time and even uh, double it again. We're, the United Nations right now is predicting within a decade or so there will be 200 million uh, refugees worldwide trying to find a new place to land. And the problem is, over in Africa, illiteracy is the rule. And that rule uh, simply sees all these humans uh, propagating beyond sustainability and beyond food and water and, and all that goes with that. And they're all literally trying to get into, right now, the United States of America. They're trying Let, to get into Canada. They're it, streaming let, into let's, Europe. Let's talk about that. Because mm -hmm. in your book, you look at it in terms of acreage. And Again, why is population important here in America? It, mm -hmm. It's important because when you look at our individual carbon footprints are highly consumptive. But you have an example in your book when you look at it in terms of acreage, moving right. someone from point A to here in the United States and the impact of that. Could you delve into that a little bit more for the audience? I certainly can. Uh, everything has what is, every, every human being on the planet has an ecological footprint. And in Africa, the average tribal person uh, lives on 0.4 acres of land. Mm -hmm. That is his or her ecological footprint. In other words, they sustain themselves. They have a little hut, they have a little house or they whatever, and they live on four tenths of one acre, which is minimal. As soon as anyone from the third world that has that kind of an ecological footprint immigrates over to the United States of America, the ecological footprint turns to 25.4 acres. 25.4 acres. 25.4 acres. And so that's like over 100, 200 times more than 300 times more than what they, they have over in Africa. So once they get here, they get the house, they get um, houses, they've got to have to have wilderness is destroyed to feed them, uh, you know, tens and 20 and 50 acres of farmland needs to be produced, cities need to be produced, uh, bowling alleys, uh, sports stadiums, you name it. So their ecological footprint literally jumps from a minuscule 0.4 acres all the way to 25.4 acres. So 
if you take a hundred, just say a hundred million more people added to the United States times 25.4 acres, you now have 2.54 billion, B as in boy, billion acres of land that must be destroyed to house and sustain all of these new immigrants that have landed into this country. Well, 2.54 billion acres of land is, I think, pretty much bigger than Maine, the, the entire state of Maine. So you have to ask yourself, uh, do we want more species extinction here in the United States? Because species extinction right now is running at 100 species a day, uh, somewhere between 80 and 100 species a day, uh, according to the, to the top experts. Uh, uh, you can read uh, Dave Foreman's uh, book, uh, Swarm, uh, oh, Man Swarm. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Man Swarm. Yeah, Man Swarm. Yes. And I know Dave Foreman. He's a brilliant writer and, and he cares about the planet. So you have to ask yourself, do you, do you want to see 2.54 billion more acres here in the United States put into concrete and asphalt? Because if you do, you, then you, you really, you, you're really giving your children a complete ecological nightmare. And so that's, what we're facing and that's what's going on as far as an ecological footprint. The same thing, there's any, I mean, a, a, an African a, a person or somebody from India only uses five gallons of water every day. How much over here? 80 to 90 gallons of water. Wow. So when you start adding a uh, hundred million more people and then you start saying 80 to 90 gallons of water every day, you're talking about a really big problem uh, because at some point there won't be enough water. That's just simply a an environmental fact, and it's a frightening fact, and it's a it's really a sobering fact. And so, how can you solve it when you can't solve it? What are you going to do when you can't solve it? And what are you going to do when there's no water in your tap? And then what are you going to do about the quality of life that just went from what you expect today and what you enjoy today to a half quality of life or diminished quality of life? or virtually no quality of life like they have there in Bangladesh or in India, et cetera. So Africa is one of the big problems because they're the fastest growing continent on the planet. Number two, India has 1.3 billion people is expected to add 300 million more people because they're growing at over 14 million per year. And they, of course, are immigrating into the United States as fast as they can. The rich of India are buying their way over here. And you can't blame them. Why would you want to live in India? I wouldn't want to live in India. You, you, here is a, this is a fact that is almost terrifying. In India, the water is so filthy and the Ganges, which I floated, Ganga, is a, a sewer pipe that leads out into the Indian Ocean with a 20,000 square mile dead zone. And it's filthy, chemicals. No one can drink anything there. And in fact, children under 12, 2,195 children under 12 die every day in India from dysentery and diarrhea and other waterborne diseases. And guess what? They can't solve it because they're adding 14 million more people annually, net gain. And so there's no solutions. And 70, excuse me, 60 60.2% of Indians do not have access to a toilet. So you can imagine the human waste and the human urine that just simply seeps into the ground all over India. Did you hear that figure? I mean, Kevin, are you, is your jaw dropping it's, right uh, now? It's, it's mind blowing and it's interesting. And aside from the environmental factors you're talking about, Imagine not for let's just say 10 million people entering a job market every year. You know, their <laughs> Prime Minister Modi talks about all these economic growth initiatives. Uh, and we have been literally offshoring all these white collar jobs that used to, you know, provide decent livings here in the U.S. there. But it's really just a trickle. I mean, it's a drop in the bucket. They'll never get to that that level of economic growth or prosperity there for the average Indian that they're dreaming about. Again, it's population. The overpopulation just seems to be interfering with these plans. That's exactly correct. And of course, culture doesn't change. 
overnight. And so that's why you see the cultures of Africa continue to have seven and eight children per woman. Uh, the religion doesn't change and the enlightenment doesn't change and the education can't change because there's no way to educate all those people. The same thing's going on in India. I mean, the illiteracy rates are just through the roof uh, and there's no way to, I mean, the sacred cow over there, the, the cows get to go wandering around and you just can't believe this and they just do their business on the streets. There's urine, there's feces, there's, I mean, it, Mumbai is a nightmare. Uh, and so that's what's that's what's going on over there and they're not going to change it it's not going to change and they're going to hit 1.6 billion people and outstrip china now china has 1.4 billion and they're going to add 100 million even though they have one child per woman uh, and that's because of population momentum there's so many women having one child that they keep adding eight uh, and as high as 10 billion more net gain per year and I can tell you, the, 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 same Gan, the same Ganges is polluted, but the Yancey, which I floated also, is just as polluted, and it's got a 20,000 square mile dead zone. And all of that polluted water is literally circulating around the world. So you can see the, the pollution doesn't just stay right there in China or India or Bangladesh. It is literally circulating around the, the world and poisoning the dolphins and poisoning the reefs and bleaching the reefs and and poisoning the food, the fish. I mean, yep. we now have, again, 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic floating or sunk in the oceans. And, and the plastic doesn't break down, but some of it does. And it's creating microplastics we're now, that are now being eaten by the fish. Oh. So that when you eat tuna and you eat the salmon and you eat any seagoing creature, you're eating plastic, which is a carbon particle. It's sure. oil. You're eating oil in the fish that you eat. That's why. And, and it's not fish oil. Well, I'm I'm glad yeah, you right. brought up the 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 concept of momentum when it comes to births and mm -hmm. rates. Because even though China, they, they adopted the one child policy for a long time, they recently changed it because, again, they're even saying, oh, my God, we're not going to have enough uh, population <laughs> to sustain us, amazingly. <laughs> but th it's that momentum. You're, built, you're adding people onto a much bigger number. Can you explain that in a, a little more detail for our audience and why when people, because people will talk about the rate, oh, the rates are down, so all is good. Uh-uh. That's, That's not correct. Quite. The rates may be going down as fertility levels and replacement levels, but the population rise continues unabated at well over 83 million net gain new babies every year. As a matter of fact, I'll give you some uh, figures. Uh, around the world, every year, 57 million people die of all causes. Well, the third world uh, not only replaces the 50 million, uh, the, the 57 million, mm -hmm. but it adds another 83 million on top of that. So can you imagine you just add, you know, 57 million plus 83 million. How do you educate and how do you water and how do you sustain and how do you feed all those people when most of them are coming up in, in, in countries that are illiterate and have no, no possibility to have farming methods or uh, any kind of growing methods and or water or any kind of arable soil. So as you're starting to see from this, the first 30 minutes of this broadcast, these numbers are so huge. Well, I've seen them personally. And once they land on a country, there are no solutions. And that's what we're bucking up against here. And that's why on an individual level, America and our families are like Thelma and Louise, and all of us collectively are like literally passengers on the USS Titanic. And so chapter four is the recipient nations of the birth rate overload. Well, guess where all these people want to land? They want to land in Europe. They want to land in any country that's still viable. But if they keep landing on these countries that are still viable, they will turn those countries into the same thing they fled. And, and, and again, the United States will become a victim of all of this immigration rather than a wonderful beacon of light. It'll simply, the light will be extinguished and America's quality of life, standard of living, and every other thing that you take uh, for granted in your life,
will not be there for you or your children if you are here in 2050. So section two of the book, what our civilization faces, it's the little things that add up to the big problems, accelerating population growth consequences, endless, endless additions create endless shortages. No species can get away with this, and I guarantee you, neither can ours. Oil enabled a hundred year window that's closing. What are we going to do when oil is finally so totally exhausted or so impossible to pump out of the ground or so costly, how there is no energy out there, not wind, not solar, no, not, not, not nothing, hydro, yeah, nothing, nothing has, oil. when you look at the, the amount of number, the amount of BTU, British thermal units in a gallon yeah, of gasoline soon. and what it's able to do and produce and real productivity, there, there's nothing. And the thing is, isn't it odd too, uh, Frosty, because the, whether it's an electric vehicle, whether it's a wind turbine, whether it's a solar cell, it's the carbon industries that are creating, are, are making those. There, there, there's no carbon free lunch, correct? That's, that's exactly correct. You know, I appreciate that you've done your homework. And I hope that every person uh, there in Washington, D.C. that understands what we're understanding on this broadcast uh, will start taking stronger action. I mean, I would challenge the National Resources Defense uh, Club. The, I mean, every one the Audubon Society, I would challenge, obviously, the Sierra Club because Sierra Club does nothing to speak about immigration or population because they've been bribed by $100 million about 30 years ago. And I was a member of, of John Muir's Sierra Club uh, through my youth and middle age, but then I, I resigned because they literally backstabbed reality. And, and because of money, uh, they, they just want money right. to keep pouring it was in. Right, that fellow Galbaum, I forget the Gal year. Galfin or Galbaum? Gal Galbaum, Galbaum, he, yeah. he gave them a, the Sierra Club, a hundred million dollars, right. correct? Right. That's correct. That's correct. To, to shut up and make sure that they never talked about immigration and or overpopulation. And it's, it's oxymoronic to sit here and pretend that you're going to save all these species here in North America and then add a hundred million more people that are going to encroach on the natural world and the ecological footprint, which we just talked about, simply destroys habitat so that at some point, the grizzly bear will be extinct in North America. Well, the grizzly bear will be extinct. Certainly, uh, any and all of uh, the different fish, we're, we're damming up all of the rivers. We're literally putting, we're, put, we're laying down cement and asphalt at such a rate of speed that we're turning cities into cement and, and, and we're turning the wilderness into cement and, and we're mm -hmm. crushing the national parks. I mean, I went up to a Glacier this summer. I went into Yosemite. You have to have a reservation. You have to have a reservation in the Rocky Mountain National Park. You have to have a that's reservation. A, right. I, that's why I typically go in the early spring, late or winter, fall. because or right. because I, you just can't get in anymore in the summer too. I was in Glacier actually in the early spring this year, so yeah. I just I just don't want to put up with it anymore. Well, yeah, and, and so at some point, all of us Americans will no longer be able to visit our national parks because even if you do get in with a lottery ticket, you're talking about a mob of people, a horde of people, that there's no way you can have a wilderness experience. Right. You know, I'm a backpacker. I love to be out in the wilds. In fact, <laughs> t tomorrow I'm going to be heading uh, up to uh, Magic Lake and, and I'm going to go fly fishing. <laughs> so... That's what we're facing. The quality of our lives are going to be so diminished because the population goes up, our freedoms go down. There will be more restrictions. And so uh, here's the chapter 11, gridlock traffic worldwide. Most people don't realize it, but we lose 40,000 uh, people every year uh, to death in America from traffic accidents. Well, over a yeah. million three are, get killed in traffic accidents worldwide. And, and then I've got one chapter, the oceans of plastic. You can't imagine how we're destroying the oceans and the animals and marine creatures until you see it firsthand. But we can't keep doing this because when you watch Sea Spiracy, you're going to have a whole new understanding of what we face and what the oceans are facing. And we are literally killing the oceans right now. And if we keep going, 
there will not be any layers of fish. Uh, there won't be shark. We kill 100 million sharks a year and have been for the last 30 years. That's documented. They're, they're going extinct. The sharks are the main source of balance in the oceans. Mm. And everything else depends on it. And we're killing them off. We're also killing the bees in America and right. worldwide. The bee, you know, whether it's Roundup or whether it's Weed Be Gone or whether it's the glyphosates, bees are what make everything work. They pollinate the flowers. All the pollinators are being killed. They have to have beehives in all the, all the uh, fields nowadays, and they hire them. At some point, the bees won't be able to withstand all the poisons, and they're going to go the way of the dinosaur. And once they go, the pollinators, whether it's bats or whether it's hummingbirds, whether it's bumblebees, whether it's honeybees, once they're gone, you're gone or your kids are gone. You know, so isn't it funny? When we were kids, like I grew up in a rural area of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And if you drove in the summertime a half hour or an hour, or let's just say we end up doing a long trip out from uh, the Philadelphia area, southeast Pennsylvania, out to Pittsburgh, when you would stop to fill up with gas, you would have to wash the insects off your windshield. And I drove out to the Pittsburgh area a couple months ago and not a single insect. Well, a couple, a handful, but it wasn't, in fact, I never, during the day, I never had to clean off my windshield. I mean, that's a very, it sounds, you know, silly, but it's, it's an indicator of where we are. It truly is, and we're in trouble. There's no question, because if the insect world is in trouble, uh, then uh, you know that you're in trouble because insects are what make the world really uh, work, and and this balance of nature, and, and one of the other things that really is distressing, and I show it in chapter 21, is the genetically modified organisms, unleashing mm. 21st century Frankenstein on a natural world. These GMOs are the worst thing that could ever happen to nature, whether it's the fish that are now being unleashed into the oceans that are GMOs or, or the corn, which is, you know, corn is all of it. Notice that GMO corn is like 90, 95% of all the corn today, and they feed all the cows the GMO corn, and then you eat the flesh of the GMO, you know, and same with soy. So you're, you're getting all this artificial, unnatural, food put into your system and everybody wonders why uh, our our bacteria in our gut and everybody's having gut problems in this country is because they're eating Doritos and drinking yeah. Coke. And, and it, it, it's a direct food. result of we have been cementing under farmland uh, at an amazing mm -hmm. an alarming rate of I live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I grew up in Bucks County on a small farm and I couldn't bring myself to move back to Bucks County when I finally returned to Pennsylvania because it had been essentially developed. And that was all the prime, for, it seems they they developed the prime farmland first. So obviously now because you've got poor soil, so you need greater, more additives, more fertilizer, more of these mm -hmm. uh, genetically modified organisms uh, to how, you know, to increase the number of bushels per acre. It's, it's, it's crazy. It is really crazy. And as an old farm boy from Michigan, I can tell you, uh, we are going to pay for the destruction of our soils and certainly for the cross, the cross pollinization of these GMO plants, uh, the honeybees getting killed because of that. Uh, even the hummingbirds are getting their tongues stuck to the, the roofs of their beaks because uh, they're getting into all these GMO flowers and you name it. Uh, the consequences are grave, and, and again, uh, you'll see that in those two documentaries uh, that I discussed earlier. And probably one of the pivotal parts of this book, which is 40 chapters, is chapter 22. Humanity's 300-year self-terminating experiment with industrialism. It's a book by Christopher O. Clugston, and it's called Blip. And the subtitle, Humanity's 300-year self-terminating experiment with industrialism he is the for, einstein of resources for those who want to know what it looks like i keep this on my bookshelf and you can see i've dog-eared a lot of it because <laughs> uh 
this this is the manual. Uh, it really is. It's it's an amazing work. It is a brilliant work. He he again. He's the Einstein of resources, and he's telling us point blank, by 2050, if not sooner, we will run out of the 80 minerals and metals that make everything work. Whether it's lithium for batteries, or lead, or zinc, or copper, or you can go on down the line. There's 80 different minerals and metals that make our civilization work, that make your cell phone work, that make your TV work, your car work, etc. Those will all be gone by 2050, if not sooner. And that's what he predicts. He projects total collapse of all the cities of the world because there's no way that they can sustain themselves and that the, the, all the systems will simply collapse and, and there will be more than 2.2 billion more people wanting all of those minerals and metals and they will not be there for anyone and and we won't be able to scrap them up we won't be able to scrape them up the planet is finite but unfortunately mm. humanity's exponential growth has been unfortunately infinite we think we can just keep growing and guess what there are limits and if you see uh, dr albert bartlett's video i highly recommend it uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put a link to that in the Good. comments section because everyone needs to see and understand what exponential growth is. Perfect. And, and Dr. Albert Bartlett said humanity's greatest uh, uh, greatest mistake is that they didn't understand the exponential growth factor. And there's many quotes by him, and he is, like I say, I, I cried the day he passed away. We had such a friendship over the years. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're all on a one-way ticket off this planet, but you sure like to live at least a full life and do what you do, and he did extremely well. Uh, so, again, that 22 is nasty. Uh, section 3 is environmental, sociological, quality of life issues. Uh, you, you can... You can you can go through all of those and those will give you just a feeling of of the sociological consequences and ramifications of unlimited immigration, um, incompatible cultures, uh, different mindsets, different cultural mindsets, different religious mindsets. I, I, I don't really jump on this one as much, but it has a factor in how societies break up. If you look at what happened to Rome. Uh, the same things happened in Rome are now kind of happening here in the United States. Uh, section four is compelling reasons to change course. The serious realities facing our civilization in the 21st century. Uh, I also talk about immigration policy without population policy is illogical. Edward Hartman wrote a brilliant book about that and he, I know him for the last 20 years and you can't escape what he writes and what the facts are. Right, because um, I mean, like, because here in the U.S., our, I think you had mentioned, ninety percent of our population growth is a direct result of immigrants and their offspring, and for us, we can con con we can control that uh, through regulating and restricting, yet the will doesn't seem to be there, and <clears throat> we're kind of coming up on our hour, Frosty, mm -hmm. but I was wondering. How can how can I have that conversation with someone who, you know, most people I think are very good natured and, and they want to help. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they really do. They, they want to be good citizens of the earth. They want to help their fellow man. But how do we have this conversation with them about immigration when they've been conditioned to think, oh, if I try to restrict immigration, I'm being... Uh, xenophobic or if i'm trying to restrict immigration well i'm not letting someone enjoy the benefits that i enjoy i'm being selfish i mean you've, you've of course laid it out but have you been able to have a conversation like that with someone and change their point of view i've certainly tried to use logic and reality and facts to bring this issue to a, an enlightenment. And there's no question, everybody has a heart and everybody wants to help everybody and we're all in this together and humanity uh, is hopefully at some point gonna be able to help itself. I also know that if your country sinks, if it is destroyed, if it collapses, if your civilization is no longer able to function 
then all of the do-gooder uh, immigration and saving the world and all that simply will end up in collapse so that nothing you did was any good. Wouldn't it have been better for all the passengers on the Titanic to run up to Captain Smith in the wheelhouse and say, would you please slow down? That we're in iceberg waters. And so that's what I'm doing. And the only way that we, our country, this civilization can help the rest of the world is if we're operational, if we have viability. Right. And, and the only way we can have viability, and I say it in my book, no matter where you are on the planet, you better start helping your own society and your own civilization instead of trying to migrate to someplace else. Because in the end, you're planted where you're planted and you better take action in Somalia, or you better take action in India or Bangladesh or in China or Russia or, or Germany or France or Norway or Sweden. You have to save your own society first in order to help others. And so for me, we have to be an example. And if we're a viable example, and I, I put it in my book, that we have two choices. Number one, cut off all immigration into America. Mm -hmm. That will literally start solving the problem. And or if that's too harsh for your emotional tie to the immigration has built this country sort of uh, mantra, uh, if 50,000 people leave America every year, then we can accept 50,000 uh, immigrants back into America to give a net gain of zero. And, and that's that's the goal. My book has, like I say, three chapters, which you can do uh, individually, which you can do in your community, which you can do in your state, which you can do nationally and internationally, because we are all in this together. I mean, essentially, the whole the whole globe and all the the, the 7.8 billion people on the globe right now uh, are on the Titanic. And, and either we all work together and this discussion should be, we should have a national, an, an international, we should start a national conference in the United States of the greatest minds and the greatest thinkers right now to get solutions to what we're facing. And that, interna that national conference should then include international uh, leaders from all around the world every year to start taking hard looks at what's coming and then start creating viable solutions. Uh, because if we don't, we're all going to become victims. And that is a biological, ecological, uh, and numbers fact that there is no way to escape it. And that's what my book talks about. There's no escaping this thing but we can change course. And that means somebody better get on 60 Minutes. I, I'm hoping to get on GoFundMe and buy my way. If I can get $100,000, I'm gonna buy my way on every TV, every radio show uh, that I can. I would love to give my program, uh, The Coming Population Crisis in America and How to Change Course to a joint session of Congress because they need to know this. And my slideshow will knock them off their socks because so what I've- Frosty, yeah. so how can mm -hmm. people find you on the internet? You can find me on Facebook with Frosty Woldridge. Uh, I, have a, a, I have a website, howtolivealifeofadventure.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on uh, about eight different uh, news service websites. Uh, I uh, publish uh, two articles every week on environment, on overpopulation, on immigration, on energy, uh, you name it, I write about it. And, and is there a way for people to donate to you on your websites? You know, there there isn't at this point. Um, and so the only thing that I'm hoping to do by creating this uh, GoFundMe, that they could, they could go to my GoFundMe, but I'm not going to get that up for another week yet. So uh, there's well, no I'll way to be donate. sure to add it to the comments mm -hmm. when we put this up on our YouTube channel and other channels. And well, they can uh, contact me. They can contact me at howtolivealifeofadventure.com. And if they wanted to, uh, I would send them my address and they could donate that way. That's the only only way I could do great. it. Great. Right and I'll be sure to put links to that in the mm -hmm. comments sure. section. Sure. Frosty. Frosty Woolridge, thank you so much for joining uh, me here today and taking the time out to speak to our audience, our great audience, uh, which brings me to one very important thing. 
before we wrap up, uh, be sure everyone, if you enjoyed watching this video, as much fun as we've had <laughs> putting it on, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And better yet, make sure if you currently subscribe to us, make sure that you, you still are subscribed. And if you're not, be sure to hit that subscribe button. That way you're going to be notified every time we put up a new video. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to put all the uh, links and websites Frosty talked about uh, during this podcast up on, in the comments section. And again, thank everyone for being here. Frosty, thank you for joining us and have a great day. Bye-bye. It's a pleasure.